Welcome to the Someone Somewhere podcast. It's Tuesday, May 5th, and I'm your host, Nicole. This is episode 35. This episode is brought to you by hashtag fam taught me, my fertility awareness education initiative. Find all of my fertility awareness blogs on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash fam taught me and follow me on Instagram at fam taught me to learn more. I'm available for one-on-one consultations as single sessions, monthly sessions, or quarterly sessions, and I'd love to work with you. I've also created the hashtag fam taught me paper charting journal, and I invite you to check it out on my Patreon where you can order it directly. Thyroid disease comes up in a number of ways in the menstrual cycle, and this is very personal to me because I discovered I had hypothyroidism when I got off of the pill and started charting my morning temperatures with fertility awareness. I had no idea that the use of the pill for a year could have already impacted my metabolism, and when all my symptoms lined up with hypothyroidism, it took me a couple years to get my body back on track. So I'll talk more about my story with charting later on in this podcast, But for now, let's introduce the thyroid. The thyroid, located in the throat, is a small gland that manufactures thyroid hormones. The hormone secreted by the thyroid gland controls the speed at which the body converts food into energy, that is, your metabolism. Thyroid hormones are essential for all metabolic activity, including ovulation and a healthy pregnancy. Two hormones directly affect ovarian function, T3 and T4, and the ovaries have receptors to those hormones. The endocrine system is a system of communication, of hormones talking and regulating every cell process. There are a few different thyroid hormones. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone, which is secreted by the pituitary gland in the brain. It instructs the thyroid to make more hormones when the hypothalamus perceives low levels of thyroid hormone in the body. The thyroid-secreted hormones are called T4 and T3. The vast majority of thyroid hormone that is made by the thyroid gland itself is T4. And T4 is not exactly ready to be used. It has to be converted inside the cells to either T3, the active form of thyroid hormone, or reverse T3, an inactive form. The gland makes a small amount of T3, about 10%, But most of the thyroid hormone that you will use will have to be converted from T4 to T3 once it gets inside the cell. When there is enough thyroid hormone circulating, the pituitary reduces its output of TSH to keep levels from rising too high. There are different types of thyroid conditions. When our thyroid is working optimally, it's not working too fast or too slow. There are a few different kinds of thyroid conditions, and they can be quite different from one another. Hypothyroidism. This is a slow thyroid. It's a condition characterized by the thyroid gland not being able to make enough thyroid hormone. Hyperthyroidism. This is a fast thyroid, a condition where the thyroid gland is overproducing thyroid hormone. And then there are the autoimmune versions. Hashimoto's. This is where your immune system actually attacks your thyroid damaging it to the point where you can't make your own thyroid hormones. This causes hypothyroidism, or a slow thyroid. And Graves' disease. This is the other type of autoimmune thyroid disorder. The immune system malfunctions, releasing abnormal antibodies that mimic the thyroid-stimulating hormone. So these false signals essentially tell the thyroid to produce more and more thyroid hormone, which causes hyperthyroidism, or an overactive thyroid. So we can see that there's this pretty strong autoimmune connection to thyroid disorders. And in fact, the majority of thyroid disorders are going to be rooted in these instances of immune dysfunction. Now, the typical focus of clinical medicine is the thyroid gland, what we call glandular hypo or hyperthyroidism. So the doctor would be asking, what is the thyroid gland doing? What hormones is it producing and in what levels? Is it damaged? However, with the thyroid, there's actually more to the story. The thyroid gland is what makes the hormones, but ultimately those hormones leave the gland and are transported via the bloodstream, with the end goal being to perform a function inside of the cells of your body. The main goal of thyroid hormone is to get inside your cells and find what is called the nuclear receptor. 
These receptors interacting with your genes are what regulates the metabolism and homeostasis of the cell and the person at large. Cellular hypothyroidism is where the gland is making thyroid hormone in the correct levels, and there's enough circulating in the bloodstream, but not enough of that active thyroid hormone called T3 is able to reach the nuclear receptor inside the cell, or it's able to get into the cell, but the cell is deactivating it. What scientists are coming to understand now is that cellular hypothyroidism can be developing for months or years before the thyroid gland starts malfunctioning, or before blood levels on a thyroid test show any abnormality. This obviously complicates the picture when it comes to testing the thyroid and relying on that alone for diagnosis. You can think of cellular hypothyroidism in a similar way to insulin resistance, where insulin has trouble getting inside the cell, and this is the precursor to diabetes. Cellular hypothyroidism is like a cellular resistance to active thyroid hormone, and though many factors can influence it, one of the most impactful is inflammation, which has the ability to downregulate metabolism. Cellular thyroid issues are the precursor to full-blown glandular thyroid disease, and once you have glandular thyroid disease, you definitely also have cellular thyroid disease. And it's pretty fascinating that the cell has so much power and control here, but it's for good reason. The cells must have some form of autonomy in regards to metabolic function, because if the gland had ultimate control, anytime the thyroid made hormones and put them out into the bloodstream, all of the tissues of the body would see an upregulation in their metabolism all at once. Different parts of our body regulate themselves on different schedules and to adapt to change. So there is a cellular independence that is important to regulating your metabolism and keeping body-wide homeostasis. But with a trigger like inflammation, the cells are becoming resistant to thyroid hormone altogether. And that's where you can start to exhibit symptoms of thyroid issues well before you're out of range on a blood test. Symptoms are the most reliable indicator that there's a thyroid issue going on. Symptoms should always be regarded as more important than the reference ranges on a blood test, especially after we just explained that the thyroid disease starts in the cells and not with what the gland is doing. So I'm going to talk about hyperthyroidism first, which again is excessively high thyroid activity. Some of the symptoms include excessive sweating, intolerance to heat, increased bowel movements and diarrhea, tremor, usually fine shaking, nervousness, agitation, anxiety, rapid heart rate, palpitations, irregular heart rate, weight loss, fatigue, muscle weakness, and trouble sleeping. And in the menstrual cycle of someone with hyperthyroidism, we might see higher than normal waking temperatures, short cycles with light bleeding during menstruation, short luteal or post-ovulatory phases, milk in the breasts when you're not nursing, and infertility. And Graves' disease, the autoimmune disorder which causes hyperthyroidism, you may see, in addition to everything I've just listed, a swollen thyroid gland called a goiter, and also high T3 and T4 levels on a blood test. With hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid function, some symptoms we might see are fatigue and sluggishness, increased sensitivity to cold, constipation, pale and dry skin, a puffy face, brittle nails, hair loss, enlargement of the tongue, unexplained weight gain, muscle aches, tenderness, and stiffness, joint pain, stiffness, in the joints, muscle weakness, depression, and memory lapse. And in the menstrual cycle of someone with hypothyroidism, we may see excessive or prolonged menstrual bleeding, lower than normal waking temperatures, anovulatory cycles where no thermal shift or ovulation is observed, longer than normal cycles, prolonged phases of less fertile quality cervical fluid, short luteal phases, and unexplained infertility or miscarriage. And with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the autoimmune disorder which causes hypothyroidism, you may see in addition to everything I've just listed, the swollen thyroid gland again, and elevated TPO antibodies on a blood test. 
So we can see that the symptoms of fast thyroid versus slow thyroid are quite different. And they pretty much align with what you think slowing down your metabolism or speeding up your metabolism would do to your body. Um, and there are additional markers such as immune antibodies on a blood test for the autoimmune versions of these conditions. Now, symptoms are the most reliable marker that something is going on with a thyroid, and they really are the key factor to the proper diagnosis. And I also wanted to kind of take a moment to acknowledge that mental health is a big indicator of thyroid dysfunction, and up to 20% of depression may be due to an undiagnosed problem with a thyroid. And that's one in five people who have been diagnosed with depression. So that's, that's quite a lot. Anxiety and brain fog are also really common symptoms. So I recommend anybody who's struggling with depression or anxiety um, or cloudiness that you really investigate how your thyroid function could possibly be related. And you're just going to put yourself in a better position to feel better if your thyroid is functioning optimally. As you can see, there's quite a few symptoms to work through, and the symptoms are disruptive enough to life that this is usually what's bringing people into the doctor's office in the first place. Now we need to get into how thyroid conditions are diagnosed properly. If you have symptoms of thyroid dysfunction and your menstrual cycle is also pointing to this conclusion, I really encourage you to get proper testing. However, thyroid blood tests can be highly inaccurate for a number of reasons and only receiving a thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH test is not sufficient to rule out a thyroid issue if symptoms are indeed present. Your waking temperature with fertility awareness taken over time can tell you with a greater degree of accuracy whether or not you need to give more support to your thyroid. And I'll talk about thyroid issues in the context of fertility awareness charting in a bit. So ask your doctor for further thyroid investigation and a full thyroid panel. If you have a family history of thyroid issues, if you have symptoms of thyroid dysfunction, such as some of the things I just mentioned, or if your menstrual charts indicate thyroid dysfunction, such as lower or higher than normal waking temperatures. But first we should talk about what typically happens when you approach your doctor with the suspicion of thyroid issues. The first test that is typically performed is just the thyroid stimulating hormone test. Now this is a test of thyroid gland function, and if it's in the normal range on a blood test, your doctor will likely tell you that you do not have a thyroid issue, and so no further testing or investigation is performed. But this leaves people confused when they actually do have moderate to severe thyroid symptoms, but this is a problem with the model, not the patient. Lab tests should be interpreted in the context of patient's symptoms, not read as a definitive marker for whether or not a person receives a diagnosis. First off, TSH doesn't assess how well the thyroid is functioning in the whole body. It only measures the impacts to the brain and the thyroid gland. The idea is that when the thyroid function is low, the pituitary gland tries to make lots more thyroid hormone to compensate and thus you should see elevated levels of TSH on a blood test if you have thyroid issues. However, this theory has several limitations, um, which I'll go over briefly. So inflammation, one of the main drivers of autoimmune thyroid disease, can suppress TSH production, and this in turn makes TSH levels on a blood test look normal instead of being elevated. By the time TSH is elevated in a lab range, the thyroid gland is already severely impacted and sometimes damaged irreversibly. A TSH test can be understood as not an early marker of thyroid gland dysfunction, but a late marker of thyroid gland dysfunction, and you're probably already looking at advanced disease by the time this marker is going to fall out of range on a test. Another situation involves the diogenase enzymes, which work to convert T4 into T3. If these enzymes are downregulated, this reduces the conversion of T4 into T3, and thus you have less active thyroid hormone available for use. This causes symptoms of hypothyroidism, despite the fact that TSH and T4 levels may be within a normal range on a blood test. High cortisol, or insulin resistance, such as in the case with someone with PCOS, also messes with the thyroid results because stress causes an increase in reverse T3, an inactive form of the hormone. So when there is enough T4 in the blood, 
the pituitary tells the thyroid, stop making more thyroid hormone. And this leads to a state where you have a normal TSH and a normal T4 on your blood test, but yet you still have very little free T3 active thyroid hormone available to use by your cells because most of it has been put into this reverse T3 inactive form. And yet another limitation to TSH testing is if you are pregnant. Your thyroid panels are going to look very different even in different stages of the same pregnancy. A normal pregnancy increases the demands of maternal thyroid gland because estrogen stimulates the transport proteins, resulting in a rise in T3 and T4 levels during the first half of pregnancy. TSH is suppressed by an increase in HCG, which is what you measure in a pregnancy test, and therefore your TSH may appear, particularly in early pregnancy, lower. If you're pregnant, it's essential that you work with a practitioner who understands what the thyroid is doing during pregnancy and how levels on a lab test are going to be interpreted differently. So I'll have more on that later when I talk a little bit more about the thyroid in pregnancy. But it's really important to look at other thyroid lab values as well as other inflammatory markers in order to really use labs appropriately for diagnosis, a TSH test or just TSH and T4 is not going to be adequate. So you definitely want to go into your doctor's office and your appointment really knowing to request that these particular tests be performed just so that you can have some sense of control over, over the appointment and to get the results that you really need. Remember that TSH only measures how much the thyroid gland is actually pumping out into the bloodstream. So in order to see how much of that can actually get into the cells, you have to take that more comprehensive thyroid panel. So this is going to include testing free T3, which is the T3 that is available for use by your cells, reverse T3, and when reverse T3 is high, we know that the external physiological stressors are decreasing your metabolic function and may be causing symptoms of hypothyroidism. Basically, external factors are causing your body to take what would be an active hormone and deactivate it for some reason. You'll also want to test for thyroid binding globulin. These are transport proteins that move thyroid hormone through the bloodstream and T3 uptake, and this is how much of T3 is currently bound up to those carrier binding globulin molecules and is therefore unavailable. You also want to do the antibodies tests. These are thyroid peroxidase antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies. So these are both antibodies which will test for autoimmune dysfunction. So that is really important that you get the antibody test so that you can figure out if you have an autoimmune version of thyroid disease. And then lastly, you want to look for the reverse T3 to free T3 ratio. Now, why is this important? It's because we can see what the cell is choosing to do in regard to its own metabolic choices. So this is bigger than the gland. For example, when T4 is traveling from the thyroid gland through the bloodstream and it's getting to a cell, it will have to be converted, right, to T3 to be used. And if the cell wants to stimulate your metabolism, it will indeed become T3. But if it's favoring shunting the metabolism for some reason, it will convert T4 into reverse T3, that inactive form, which doesn't bind to the nuclear receptor and it doesn't stimulate your metabolism. And because we don't know exactly what's going on inside the cells, it's very hard to measure this reverse T3 to free T3 ratio can kind of give us an approximate way to figure out what the thyroid hormones are doing at the cellular level. Lastly, you also want to request a broad metabolic panel in addition to a thyroid panel. We really want the practitioner to be able to see exactly what the metabolism is doing. Inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein as well as ferritin levels and homocysteine levels, vitamin D levels, these are things that can really help under, understand your thyroid disorder in the whole context of your body, um, but especially when your, cel your cellular hypothyroidism is what you're dealing with and it's not exactly coming from the issues and coming from the gland. So the thyroid is rarely you know, dysfunctional in a vacuum. It's really important to look at those other markers 
that could be impacting your thyroid's overall performance. So it's really important to get that whole body um, lab work done so that you and your practitioner can really work through this information. Now I'm going to talk about some treatment options. I'm going to start out with an overview of typical treatments and then move on to nutrition for thyroid health as well as some supplements that you can utilize. So starting with the clinical treatments. Level thyroxine is a synthetic thyroid hormone that is chemically identical to T4, the one that your thyroid gland makes. This prescription drug is the most common medication prescribed for hypothyroidism. And side effects include tremors, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, nervousness, irritability, excessive sweating, and changes in menstrual cycling, as well as temporary hair loss. As T4 is not the thyroid hormone actively used by the body, the use of levothyroxine still requires the patient's body to convert T4 into T3. The goal of using levothyroxine is to return TSH into the normal range if it is elevated and to improve symptoms. For some people, this will not be the case and symptoms will continue even if TSH falls into a normal range. Another clinical treatment that is perfectly safe and useful to use is desiccated thyroid. This comes from pig, sheep, or cow. Pretty interestingly, they have the same thyroid hormones as us, so it's a good match. Desiccated thyroid naturally contains both T4 and T3, as opposed to levothyroxine, which is just T4. Though both are considered natural and bioidentical to our body's own hormones. Nutrition and lifestyle have a significant impact on how well your thyroid functions. Even if you're working with your doctor utilizing a clinical treatment, to give your thyroid the best chance at healing, you need to integrate diet and lifestyle changes. The primary mineral of importance is iodine because it's an essential mineral in order for your body to make thyroid hormone. The best sources of iodine in foods are fish, shellfish, and other seafoods, seaweed, dairy, and eggs. And iodine is found in beets, cranberries, asparagus, and iodized salt, though the salt loses iodine potency with age and humidity. Some foods contain anti-nutrient compounds, called goitrogens, which block the absorption of iodine in the thyroid gland. Goitrogens are another class of anti-nutrients present in high amounts in soy. If you have known thyroid problems, you may also want to limit your intake of soy and raw cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, and kale. If you do want to eat these vegetables, you must cook or ferment them in order to reduce the goitrogen content. Strawberries, plums, figs, peaches, and red wine also contain goitrogens. After iodine, other minerals like selenium, zinc, iron, and vitamin D are needed for optimal thyroid function. Iron is a helper mineral in the production of thyroid hormones. Selenium and zinc help the conversion of the T4 thyroid hormone into the active T3 thyroid hormone. Selenium can reduce thyroid antibodies and protect against autoimmune thyroid conditions. And because there's such a strong link with autoimmunity present with the thyroid conditions, it's important to avoid inflammatory foods, gluten being the main one. A gluten-free diet may reduce thyroid antibodies, which will improve the function of your thyroid. Low levels of vitamin D are also linked to autoimmune conditions, and so supplementing can improve your thyroid production. Iron, zinc, and selenium are going to be found in high amounts in meats and seafood, especially liver and organ meats, poultry, beef, lamb and goat, eggs, and mushrooms. Brazil nuts have high concentrations of selenium as well. Supplementation is good, but the best way to get these essential thyroid minerals is to eat them in whole food form. These are the forms that they're going to be best absorbed in. And it's good to note that you need your gut to be working optimally to actually absorb the necessary nutrients for thyroid function. Because the immune system and gut are one and the same, autoimmune conditions need to take special attention to the gut and liver as two key areas for treatment. So if you do end up supplementing minerals in addition to eating dietary sources, you'll want to consider supplementing 100 to 150 micrograms per day of selenium, but do not exceed 200 micrograms per day from all sources, including high selenium foods like Brazil nuts. Supplementing with iodine is a little tricky, and iodine deficiency is not the primary cause of thyroid disease in Western countries. Remember that autoimmunity is and too much iodine can cause or worsen thyroid autoimmunity. 
So if you get tested and you don't have thyroid antibodies, then it's safe for you to take a small amount of iodine and it may promote healthy thyroid function. But if you do have thyroid antibodies, then you should not take iodine for your thyroid. For hypothyroidism, zinc supplementation is recommended at a dosage of around 15 to 30 milligrams per day. And it's also important to consider that long-term supplementation with zinc can create an imbalance of copper in the body. And as such, these two minerals are often given in combination, typically one milligram of copper per 15 milligrams of zinc. Processed foods, not sleeping enough, and environmental toxicity are going to contribute to inflammation, which has a very negative effect on your thyroid function. So just as much as we want to support thyroid function with whole foods, we also need to protect it from being damaged by chemical exposure. Thyroid damaging chemicals include plastic chemicals from plastic water bottles, food containers, canned foods lined with BPA, or by touching thermal receipts, flame retardants found on clothes, furniture, and household items, bromine which is added to food or found in agricultural chemicals, dyes, insecticides, and pharmaceuticals, chlorine in drinking water, triclosan in antibacterial soaps, fluoride in toothpaste and in tap water, non-stip chemicals from Teflon pans, parabens in personal care items, and more. Doing a proper review of your water sources, food sources, cookware, and personal care items is needed when trying to heal your thyroid. Another note about working with your diet, we don't really want to restrict caloric intake when trying to coax the thyroid to heal. You may be aware that restrictive dieting and weight loss will slow down your metabolism, and this instructs your thyroid to make less T4 and T3, and the conversion of T4 to T3 is also decreased. Set yourself up with an appropriate dietary regimen for thyroid health, but avoid a situation where your body thinks it's in starvation mode and must slow down its metabolism to further save energy, because that will be basically doing the opposite of what you want. And in certain cases, intermittent fasting can also be problematic for this reason. It's important to get to the root of your thyroid issues and correct intestinal permeability if necessary to help protect your immune system from anything that can worsen autoimmune thyroid disease. It's also important to try and identify and treat Epstein-Barr virus, which is linked as a possible trigger to autoimmune thyroid disease. The best treatment for Epstein-Barr is to continue to support the immune system with natural antiviral treatments such as zinc, selenium, and vitamin D. In addition to supplementing with minerals, you can work with these herbs as well. Ashwagandha for hypothyroidism works best when taken for at least three months. Ashwagandha has been found to increase serum T4 and T3 levels in animal studies, and dosing for ashwagandha ranges from 300 to 1,000 milligrams per day. Gum Google has long been used medicinally and shown to stimulate the thyroid in animal studies. It can also reduce high cholesterol and improve metabolic function. It contains compounds known as ketosteroids, which can increase the uptake of iodine by the thyroid gland and improve the activity of enzymes in the thyroid. It can improve the ratio of T3 to T4. The typical dosage of Gung Google, known as Comifora Mukul, are 125 milligrams twice daily. Then there's Iris Versicolor, or Blue Flag Iris, which is a helpful anti-inflammatory agent and can reduce enlargement of the thyroid in patients who have Hashimoto's. A typical dosage of Iris Versicolor is 750 milligrams per day. And lastly, there's Coleus, Coleus forsocoli, which is a plant that can activate T3 and T4 secretion from the thyroid cells in an action that's quite similar to TSH. It improves iodide uptake from the thyroid gland and increases production of thyroid hormones. It also increases something known as cyclic AMP, which can raise the metabolic function of the lower and lower the blood sugar. A typical dose of coleus is 50 milligrams per day. Now I want to talk about thyroid conditions before, during, and after pregnancy. So I'm going to start at the top, which is to talk about ovulation itself, which is obviously necessary to getting pregnant. T3 and T4 help egg growth and maturation through synergizing with follicle-stimulating hormone. Thyroid function plays a role in progesterone and estrogen production because T3 and T4 also stimulate the absorption 
of intestinal and liver cholesterol. And that cholesterol, as I've talked about in podcasts before, is the building block of every sex hormone that you make. The thyroid hormones also contribute to egg fertilization and embryo viability. The thyroid, along with estrogen itself, enhances insulin sensitivity, which is important to keeping your cycling hormones functioning properly, and progesterone stimulates thyroid function and increases metabolic rate during the second half of the menstrual cycle. You can think about how your temperatures rise after ovulation, so you essentially need more energy for that, and therefore your metabolism is increased in the latter half of your cycle. So without a healthy thyroid physiology, including in the cells, it's very difficult to get pregnant. Unfortunately, because labs are only really testing for the thyroid gland, someone can have normal labs and still have a difficult time getting pregnant because of cellular hypothyroidism. Furthermore, the clinical strategy of forcing a pregnancy with drugs that trigger ovulation is dangerous because the body is really trying to tell that person that they can't support a pregnancy and that they're even having trouble supporting the person. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the body. You know, it's really trying to protect you always. So forcing this to happen before the thyroid, you know, is really optimal is putting you and your potential fetus at risk for, you know, a whole host of issues. And if you have a history of thyroid issues or you're experiencing multiple miscarriages, make sure to get a full thyroid panel before you become pregnant again. It's essential that your practitioner be well-versed in the changing thyroid hormone levels during each stage of pregnancy, as up to one in five thyroid test results will be misinterpreted because they're not using pregnancy-specific ranges to interpret your lab work. Most especially... It's essential that thyroid antibodies are used to measure autoimmune conditions, as these are the most linked with adverse pregnancy outcomes. During pregnancy, you're going to be putting a greater strain on your thyroid gland than normal. A fetus doesn't produce its own thyroid hormones until the second trimester, and maternal thyroid hormones continue to be transferred via the placenta during the entire pregnancy. And so production of thyroid hormones increases about 50% in the first trimester, and it'll remain that way until you give birth. Iodine and thyroid hormone are absolutely essential to fetal brain development, and a lack of iodine or thyroid hormone can result in lower IQ or permanent intellectual disabilities. In a 2016 study published by The Lancelet, thyroid hormone is crucial for intrauterine neurodevelopment because it regulates migration, proliferation, and differentiation of fetal neuronal cells that form gray matter later in life, as well as synaptogenesis and myelination. Nutritional needs are increased in general during pregnancy, and many of these have direct correlation with increased thyroid production. So you're going to want to follow the general nutritional guidelines I outlined in the nutritional treatment options, but here's some pregnancy-specific nutritional info. If you don't eat a lot of seafood or you're having pregnancy-related dislike or nausea with seafoods, make sure that your prenatal vitamin contains the recommended daily allowance for iodine. You'll need to check the label because about half of prenatal supplements actually fail to include iodine. Iron needs increase from 18 mg in non-pregnant people to 27 mg per day in pregnant people. Low iron levels are linked to hypothyroidism in pregnancy. Selenium helps reduce the thyroid antibodies and protects against postpartum hypothyroidism. And although morning sickness can be irritating in the first trimester, it's actually theorized that its cause, the cause of morning sickness, is metabolites of your thyroid hormones, where your body is deferring its own iodine and thyroid hormone stores to your fetus to promote optimal development. So if you have a curious lack of morning sickness, it may be worth it to get your thyroid hormones tested as nausea in the first trimester is linked to better pregnancy outcomes. Environmental toxicity is even more dangerous during pregnancy. Parabens are known to affect sex hormone and thyroid hormone levels in pregnant people. Prenatal pesticide exposure can harm the developing brain, resulting in developmental problems. Higher rates of preeclampsia, high blood pressure, are reported in pregnant people who were exposed to PFCs, which also damage and impair thyroid function in both the pregnant person and the newborn. And fluoride, which crosses the placenta, can result in fluoride exposure to the fetus. 
and after pregnancy, there are so many hormonal adjustments, and the thyroid is no exception. Developing thyroid issues within one year of giving birth is called postpartum thyroiditis, and it affects one in four people post-pregnancy. If you did get your thyroid tested while you were pregnant and had some issues show up, you'll need to be careful in the year after giving birth to avoid the development of autoimmune thyroid conditions. The stress of a pregnancy on the body and the thyroid itself can put you in a tough state where you're feeling the effects of thyroid disease just as you're trying to get back to being yourself or go back to work or take care of your baby or maybe thinking of having more children in the future. So postpartum thyroid dysfunction is also linked with postpartum depression. Symptoms of postpartum thyroiditis are the same as I've spoken about earlier, but the difference is that pregnancy is what triggered it. Your postpartum lab work may also come back curiously normal, but if you don't feel right, follow what your body is telling you and perform a thyroid healing regimen anyway. Now I want to get into thyroid conditions and contraceptives. This is a huge topic and I feel particularly passionate about it because it happened to me. And what's the connection between using contraceptives and thyroid conditions? It's not something that's ever made obvious to us when we go decide to try to get a prescription for birth control. Thankfully for me, my hypothyroidism was temporary and it was caused by using the birth control pill. I used ortho tricycline low for six months followed by low low estrin FE for six months, so in total for one year. And I had no symptoms of thyroid dysfunction prior to using the pill, but in the first six months after I got off the pill, my fertility awareness charts indicated a temporary state of hypothyroidism and also PCOS. So how did birth control cause hypothyroidism? Why aren't we made aware of this? In a typical menstrual cycle, there's a balance between the hormones, estrogen and progesterone. You have neither in high levels during the entire cycle. The follicular phase before ovulation is when you naturally have high estrogen. And the luteal phase after ovulation is when you naturally have high progesterone. And they keep each other in check. Estrogen blocks the release of hormones from the thyroid gland, while progesterone facilitates the release. But in order to make progesterone, you have to ovulate. If you use ovulation suppressing drugs like contraceptives, you're in a progesterone deficient state and therefore an estrogen excess state by default. This enlarges the thyroid gland and is associated with a hypothyroid state. In addition, the estrogen in birth control increases thyroxine binding globulin, which I talked about earlier. Binding globulins are transport proteins. Their job is to move thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland through the bloodstream to the cells, and they want to get to the cells that they're needed in. So you want the level of TBG in your body not to be too high or too low. If it's too low, you can have too much free thyroid hormone available, which leads to thyroid resistance. But if it's too high, all these transport proteins have bound up all the thyroid hormone, and so there isn't any available to enter the cells. So when you use contraceptives, all this excess thyroxine binding globulin does what it's supposed to do. It binds to the thyroid hormone put out by your gland, but this ties up a lot of the circulating thyroid hormone, what we call the total level of hormone that you may have, and this leaves less free available hormone for use by your body. So an excess of circulating TBG leads to lower levels of free thyroid hormone available for use by our cells, and this is how the pill causes and exacerbates hypothyroidism over time. Birth control pills also deplete B vitamins, selenium, zinc, and the amino acid tyrosine from our bodies. These are all vitamins and minerals that are necessary for proper thyroid function, meaning they're necessary for making, activating, and synthesizing the thyroid hormone. Contraceptives are also inflammatory to the body. And we've talked a lot already about how inflammation is detrimental to thyroid function, But one way in particular where this manifests is that inflammation will take your available T4 and convert it into reverse T3, essentially deactivating it for use by the body and also making you feel very tired. The pill also increases the C-reactive protein, which is a major inflammatory marker. In addition, contraceptives disrupt the gut's natural biome, 
Not a good idea for anyone with autoimmune thyroid conditions, which are linked with gut dysbiosis. Combined oral contraceptives increase the risk of the formation of gallstones and gallbladder attacks. So then there's the question of what about progestin-only contraceptives, like the mini pill, implants, or Depo-Provera. Although progestin-only contraceptives do not have estrogen, they also don't have progesterone either. Synthetic progestins are not metabolized by your body in the same way that your homemade progesterone is, and therefore you won't get the thyroid-stimulating effects from using progestins. By taking progestin-only contraceptives, you are still in a progesterone-deficient state and a state of estrogen excess by way of not ovulating. Therefore, this still blocks the amount of thyroid hormone that you release from your thyroid gland. In addition, the same nutrient deficiencies and inflammatory issues are present with progestin-only contraceptives and implants. Many of the side effects listed for contraceptives have a curious overlap with symptoms of thyroid disease. So how can fertility awareness charting help you diagnose your thyroid issues? What can charting really do for us? In my opinion, fertility awareness is an asset for anybody who's struggling or with diagnosing or managing a thyroid issue. Once you have a few cycles of data, you can use the range of waking temperatures that you take over the course of your cycle to determine the state of your metabolic health. Abnormally higher than average or abnormally lower than average waking temperatures are an obvious symptom of thyroid dysfunction, even if your blood lab results come back within normal ranges. In your charts, we want to watch for a range of temperatures. In a normal thyroid function, preovulatory temperatures are going to be between 97 degrees Fahrenheit and 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit, or 36.1 degrees Celsius to 36.4 degrees Celsius. In the postovulatory of a normal thyroid function, your range is going to be 97.6 degrees Fahrenheit to 98.3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 36.5 degrees Celsius to 36.8 degrees Celsius. And some clinicians believe that any consistent pattern of preovulatory temperatures below 97.3 degrees Fahrenheit should be tested, especially if other symptoms are present. So it's rather a narrow range of what is normal. Then there's the hypo or slow thyroid levels. For preovulatory temperatures, we're looking at 95.5 degrees Fahrenheit to 96.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 35.3 degrees Celsius to 35.8 degrees Celsius. And in the postovulatory, 96.7 degrees Fahrenheit to 97.2 degrees Fahrenheit or 35.9 degrees Celsius to 36.2 degrees Celsius. For hyperthyroidism or fast thyroid, preovulatory temperatures are going to be between 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit and 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 36.4 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees Celsius. And in the postovulatory, 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit to 99.2 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius to 37.3 degrees Celsius. So basically, you're going to want to be in that middle range and not too high or not too low. When I first read Taking Charge of Your Fertility, I was amazed that you could gain this information just from taking your temperature. After three months of my first charts, it was obvious that I was in a hypothyroid state, and I also felt just as bad as the temperature said that I would. Getting off the pill, I was pretty sluggish in the morning. I had trouble operating at a normal level for my active 23-year-old self, and it was really jarring for me to experience what that was like um, to have that shutdown feeling. I was overall moving much slower than I was used to, um, and that was really shocking to me. So I decided to go on the journey of healing my thyroid with the regimen that I described in the treatment section. I focused on eating nourishing fats and proteins. I was doing daily bone broths and eating only really leafy green vegetables. 
I took B12. I also took Vitex and Dong Quai herbs, and I really focused on de-stressing my life. I was focused on really furthering my mental health and sleeping more regularly. A lot of people have asked me kind of how I can prove that my thyroid recovered. And so in fertility awareness, we use this thing called the cover line to determine the point between the range of what is pre-ovulatory low temperatures and what is post-ovulatory high temperatures. So I have a cover line for each chart that I ovulate. And I've yet to have an anovulatory month in almost five years. So because it runs through the middle of your chart, such as like a median, it's a good indicator of the range of thyroid function every month. So I was able to identify that each cycle, I saw an incremental increase in my average waking body temperature. From February 2016 to July 2019, my cover line increased 0.82 degrees Fahrenheit in just over three years. Now that's almost an entire degree, which is pretty significant as far as temperatures go. In FAM, we measure things to the 1 100th of a degree. And the average ovulatory thermal shift that we're observing is only 0.3 to 0.5 degrees higher than the pre-ovulatory temperatures. So to see a median increase of almost a whole degree to go up a whole degree in, in temperature range is really striking. And now I'm in a completely different range of temperatures than when I had first started charting. Um, I consider that set of data to be particularly exciting because it's a confirmation that I'm now well within my normal metabolic and thyroid range. And if I didn't have the advantage of utilizing fertility awareness, I couldn't have measured how well my thyroid responded to my regimen. And so I think that self-reported data is just so valuable for you and also for your practitioner to diagnose the issue and to track your healing progress as you, as you move forward. There's just so much to be gleaned from utilizing that data and we're so lucky that one of the three fertility signs just happens to have this really intimate information about the thyroid. So if your practitioner, you know, you come in, you have your charts and you're like talking to your practitioner about taking your waking temperature, if they don't find it to be useful, that might be a good indication that they don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. So I just hope that this podcast about the thyroid is able to help you on your way of figuring out if you have thyroid issues or how to take matters into your own hands in regards to getting a proper diagnosis and also for treating it. And I mean, it's a massive topic and I've been meaning to make this podcast for a while because out of all of my clients that I've worked with one-on-one, the most common thread that I see present in fertility awareness charts so far, just anecdotally, is thyroid issues. Um, And the way that it connects to mental health issues really can't be understated. Pretty much everyone that's checking off thyroid issues or, you know, lower, higher waking temperatures, anxiety and depression are also major symptoms that they're dealing with. Um, So my goal with this podcast was to just break all that down for you so you have an actual picture of where you're at with thyroid function, what it is, what it does. And the best part is that all these nutritional guidelines are pretty much just good for your overall health. You know, your thyroid health is synonymous with your overall health, Um, seeing that your thyroid is really affecting every single cell in your body. So it's just that important. So I just want to say thanks for, for listening and to just taking all this information in. It's a lot of really, you know, scientific information, but I think that it's super valuable. And I hope that you are somewhere in your fam journey trying to figure out where your thyroid is in terms of optimal function. And I hope that this is able to help. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone. You can find my show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Anchor. And if you can take a moment to rate or review me, I would really appreciate that because it really helps more people find me and find the show and find good information. This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Education Initiative, hashtag fam taught me, and you can subscribe to my Patreon to gain access to member services at www.patreon.com slash fam taught me, and follow me on Instagram at fam taught me to learn more. This concludes episode 35 of the Someone Summer podcast. Good night.